I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my vlog of everyday living, Leo, Nicaragua. Today I had a question, and we actually are going to be answering two questions today. The first one is someone asked if they would like to hear more about our time living in Spain, one of my favorite countries in the entire world, and the first place that we lived outside of the United States. So it's an important one to tell the story of. So I, we'll dig into that for sure. And our second question is, we had a completely unrelated question, so you can skip forward to that if that's what you're looking for, is what do you do when moving to another country like Nicaragua from another country like the United States if you have precious metals or other metals investments in physical metals, not in ETFs, but in physical metals? What, what do you do when moving? We're going to answer that and talk about Spain right after that bump. Before I talk about how we moved to Spain, a little bit of background. My wife and I and our children did a long two-month backpacking trip around Europe. We call it the Grand Tour, which is the traditional name for what we did, where we spent a bunch of time all throughout Europe going to major sites that we wanted to see, like tourists, and going to places that we were seriously considering as places we might want to live long term. That was our first kind of survey of Europe. We were pretty sure that Europe is where we wanted to end up, and so we wanted to have a really broad knowledge of it before we started getting more in-depth. So our plan was was to go and do a long grand tour, a couple months, have a really good idea of different regions, the weathers, the languages, what, what it was really like on the ground, and then to come and do a really slow travel, because that was pretty fast. I mean, we did all nine countries in, in two months. And then we were going to come back and do a really slow movement through Europe over a period of years, maybe many years, possibly forever, and just keep moving and use our visa limits as a way to determine how long we could be in a place. So some places would be longer, some places would be shorter, and then really dig in and allow us to hone in on exactly what it is we'd be looking for if we ever decided to settle down, which was not something we were sure of in the beginning. We were considering the possibility of just staying on the road kind of forever. Now, when we start talking about moving, this is an area that gets a little bit confusing. So I want that was 2012 when we did that. We moved to Spain in 2015. Now, what do you define as moving? Because if you watch my channel, you know I talk about how moving to a new country, being an expat, is really just a matter of being a tourist that lingers for a while. There's no hard line between when you are just being a tourist and when you become uh, living in a new place. And of course, we're not talking about residency. That is something that requires official paperwork and is a different thing. You could be living in a place for your entire life and never be a resident. You can be a resident in some places like Mexico, we always use as an example, and never have been there. So that's a different concept. That is a legal concept of an individual nation, uh, whereas citizenship is an international uh, uh, concept that is shared between nations under a UN treaty. And where you live is kind of a human description. So this gets a little bit weird. So I want to talk about what makes it that we were living in these places, because for some people, about half of people are like, well, that's not really living in a place. And half of people are like, that's totally living in a place. And there's very little in the middle. But the way that we define where when you move to a new place, this is kind of important as expats, just from a mental exercise. If you maintain your home, so for example, let's say you have a home like we did in Dallas, Texas, and you maintain that home, you keep that home, it's available, you haven't rented it out, you haven't sold it, anything like that, you can still live there. It's still your home base. It's still set up for you. And you go on a trip and you stay somewhere, whether it's a weekend or three years, as long as you are still functioning out of that house and can go to it at any moment, you're on vacation. You may be spending a ton of time somewhere. It could be that you basically never returned, but you still maintained a home and you are tied to that place for that time period. If you uh, give up that home, you have no other home, and you go to a place, and it doesn't matter how long you're there, that's where you live at the moment, because the alternative is to be homeless. And this is something that my wife really likes a stronger definition of having moved somewhere, but she struggles to tell me what that definition would be. Uh, and the only other thing that you would be if you give up your home and you travel full time, is you would be homeless. Now, sure, you'd be wealthy homeless, you'd be affluent homeless, you'd be having a lot of fun traveling places, going out to eat homeless, but you would still be homeless, which is confusing to use. And I don't think anyone expects that term to be used, especially if you have a place. So generally, what we say is if you give up 
your home and you no longer maintain another residence somewhere and you actually obtain a residence, not residency, just a residence, a physical place where you live that is sustained. Now, some people live in hotels like their whole lives. So you can't really say that living in a hotel would never qualify, but it generally doesn't. This is just a kind of soft guideline. But if you're renting an apartment, you're going to a grocery store, you act like part of a community that's living in a place regardless of how long you're there. So in one side, you gotta give up another residency. If you're maintaining a residency and you're just a long-term tourist, that's fine. But you're a long-term tourist, which we have been at some points. When we were in Europe for two months, we were not homeless. We maintained our house in, in Texas. We did not give it up. We did not stop, stop paying rent. We didn't take renters to, to cover the cost while we were gone. We didn't change our address. We didn't do anything like that, right? Everything was set up so we could just walk back in, drop our luggage, and go back to our normal lives. Our office was still set up. All of our clothes were still in the closet and so forth. When we uh, moved to Spain in 2015, someone, so the question was also, how long were we there? So we were there for our visa limit, 90 days, so probably 89 days, right? We didn't, we didn't push any laws, but we were there for our season, which is three months. Now, for a lot of people, you're like, well, is that really moving? But it is. When we gave up our house in Texas, we rented it out. It was no longer our home. Other people lived there. And uh, when we went to Spain, we rented an apartment. We didn't stay in a hotel for a while. We made a home base in Spain. We rented a full, now it was furnished, apartment in a small community, which we'll go into, and live there, going to the grocery store, doing our normal shopping, living our normal lives. We were not on vacation going to see sites, which is fine to do. That, that doesn't mean you're not living there. Uh, and um, we weren't, you know, we, we fully settled in. My kids went to school there uh, online. They've always homeschooled. Uh, and so they did that there as well as they did in Texas. I kept working my normal job. My wife kept doing her normal stuff. Like nothing really changed other than our location. And we were based out of Spain, and then we did trips from there. We did take vacations often on weekends and we did it from that location. We didn't give up our apartment and go somewhere else. We weren't being transitory. We maintained a residence in Spain during that 90 day, day period and went and visited all over the region to learn more about it. It was an amazing experience. So that is why we define it as moving to a place because as I've done this for a decade, it is the only definition I've ever found that makes sense. Like if you try to define anything else, you end up with people who are just truly traveling, qualifying as living somewhere, or people just being homeless when they clearly have an established home where they're getting mail. And, and we received mail there even, which is a rare thing to do. But in that particular instance, we did receive mail, but it was our home base. That's where our clothes were. It's where our shoes were. It's where our computers were. It's where our video games were. Everything we had was there. It wasn't somewhere else. We always had a storage unit. We still have a storage unit now. We don't want it. We don't need it for anything. We just haven't been able to unload it yet. Paul and I were just working on a strategy for that. But we basically had a, yeah, there's some stuff we didn't sell. It's just in storage. Yes, we can go back to it. But effectively, we never did. We did. But effectively, it was not something we live out of. It's not something we operated out of uh, for very long. We really did take the things that we were living with with us, and they're basically the things we still have with us now. We A few more pieces of luggage have been added to our ensemble over the years, but that's roughly about it. So let's talk about what our time in Spain was actually like. So in 2012, when we visited Spain, we had come in uh, by train. Well, we had actually flown into Barcelona. We had meant to come in by train. There had been a landslide just the night before we were coming in. We flew into Barcelona, having come from Italy. Uh, we spent a little bit of time in Barcelona, absolutely fell in love. We were expecting Barcelona to be nice, but this was a level of nice we weren't expecting. Now, of course, that was 10 years ago. So now going to Barcelona is not the same welcoming place that it was back then. And even then, they were getting pretty tired of the tourists. Now it's way more extreme. So it has changed a bit. But Barcelona remains my wife's favorite city. And I certainly love it. Absolutely fantastic. And I do uh, try to speak Catalan. I use Duolingo Catalan on a regular basis. I'm not very good, but I can read it when I'm there. I have no problem reading Catalan, but speaking it, a little bit challenging. Uh, but I find it a very interesting language because it's like a glue language between Italian and French and Spanish. You can see how all those languages move from place to place when you learn Catalan because it's the one that sat in between them. It's really cool. Okay, so we did uh, Barcelona, loved it. It was such a cool thing, and that was part of our plan. Then we ended up, due to the flight and different changes that had happened, we had a little bit of time to kill, but we needed to orchestrate some move out of Madrid. So we took the train from Barcelona to Madrid and ended up doing a little bit of time in Madrid and 
found Madrid to be this amazing city that we were not expecting. We really didn't think Madrid was a place we wanted to stop and see. And it ended up being one of my favorite places, or probably during that trip, my favorite city of that trip. Now, I would say I probably prefer Rome, but Madrid is one of my favorite cities in the world. Absolutely love it. And I've worked there since then. We'll get to that from Madrid. We took the train and went on to uh, Portugal and its capital of Lisbon and spent some time there. And that was right at the end of our 2012 Grand Tour. So we got to spend more time in Spain and went from the northeast corner to kind of the central west uh, and crossed the whole country. Really got a feel for Spain, both with multiple cities and seeing the whole country coast to coast. Uh, that was that was really good and, and caught us by surprise because we thought seeing Spain was going to be an addendum and a real minor point that we were... We had just been misled as to how wonderful Spain was going to be. And so when we first arrived, we we're like, ah, this will be fun, new country. But it was one of the places we were least looking forward to. And by the end of our trip, it was our favorite place in Europe. So that really changed our perspective. And that was the purpose of the Grand Tour in 2012, was we really didn't have a good feel for which parts of Europe we were going to love and which parts we were just going to be eh, which parts we weren't going to like. And there was a lot of surprises on that trip. So it was a great way to go because some things I was able to predict really well from abroad, but a lot of things I was not. So we learned a lot. It was very valuable. When we then decided we were going to move abroad in 2013, it took us a little while to orchestrate everything in our lives and be ready to give up our home and actually make the jump abroad. Now, as you mentioned, we moved from Texas. That's not actually what happened. In 2013, we were living in Texas. I temporarily took a job in New York City, well, around New York City, that allowed us to kind of make a shift towards the move to Europe and, and started the whole process. So uh, we moved up to uh, the New York City area, which I worked in for all of 2014. By late 2014, I took a job in Europe that ended up being a disaster. I'll tell that story another time. Never ended up taking the job. The, the process of taking it is what ended up being a disaster and led to us having to stay in the United States for six months longer than we had ever anticipated due to legal wranglings with the companies that I was dealing with in the U.S. So I was paid. I was able to stay home. I got a lot of time playing video games with the kids. It basically bought me a you can't go to Europe, but you get to be in America on vacation and well-paid vacation time period. So it worked out just fine. I'm not complaining about how life played out in the long run. But that was going on at the end of 2014 and into the early part of 2015. So we were able to do a lot of planning for a move to Europe and a lot of thinking about what we wanted to do, but we weren't able to put anything into action without really doing a lot of damage to our finances due to this legal situation we were working our way through, which worked out just fine. Everything worked out in our favor in the end. So after putting in a bit of time uh, at home in New York, we had already gotten rid of our home in Texas. We then uh, rented out our home in New York and moved to Spain. We decided on Spain as a starting point for our adventures of living in Europe because after having done our 2012 Grand Tour, it was the place that piqued our interest the most. We knew the least about it of the least the major places that we had gone, and we absolutely adored every moment, everything we did in Spain. Plus, we really liked Portugal, which is a completely different place but is right there, and so it was a good opportunity to just spend more time in Spain. But we decided that we had seen Northeast, we had seen Central, we had gone across it. We wanted to start in the South in Andalusia, and take on a completely different part of Spain than we had seen. So we started our adventures on the south side of the hills in Granada. Granada lies in the southeast of Andalusia, near the coast, and we lived on the south side of the mountain, which means that our house high in the mountains actually had a view of the Mediterranean, and on a clear day, you could just make out the line of Africa across the Straits of Gibraltar, which is a pretty amazing spot to be. We were really thrilled by the location that we found. Prior to moving to Spain, we had read the book Driving Over Lemons, which is a pretty good story about a family that moved to that exact region of Spain, the town of Orgiva lays at the bottom of a valley, absolutely stunning region. And that is where the book took place at a farm just outside the village. And we ended up finding a beautiful apartment on the main square, the Plaza Mayor, in a tiny village called Canyar that was 24 switchbacks up the mountain from Orgiva and right next to the village of Lanjaron, one of my favorite places in all of Spain. We got settled into an old stone village house. I mean, totally, absolutely classic, what you imagine as perfection of Spain, where you're intermingled with all the houses around you and in a little village. It was the absolute best possible location for the most quintessential Southern Spanish experience. 
It's hard to imagine having found a better place to start our adventures in Spain. It was a tiny village, and it was so easy for us to manage everything there, except for driving to the grocery store, which took a major effort. But that is just part of the Spanish adventure. We learned how to drive, how to get around the region, and we took a lot of our time while I was busy working during the week. I was working a full-time job at the time, working remotely, uh, but with an office in Madrid. Uh, we were able to take our weekends and spend a lot of time exploring Andalusia, which was part of our goal to be able to use use Andalusia as a base for exploring the region. We didn't pick Canyar thinking that it was going to be our long-term home, and it didn't turn out to be. But we did pick it because we thought it would be a perfect location to learn more about what Andalusia would have to offer us, and that's exactly what happened. We started off by spending our first weekend in Arcos de la Frontera in the west. We explored places like Cadiz and uh, Cordoba, uh, Granada itself, Sevilla, Madrid, and really got to know a lot of Spain, and we took some non-Spanish trips as well, visiting places like Gibraltar and Morocco while we were there. It was also the time that my best friend Rachel moved. Uh, she had been living in Europe. Actually, she got there just before we did, maybe two or three weeks earlier. She had been in our early time in Spain, living around Europe. She eventually got stuck in uh, Holland. Uh, she was actually in Belgium. We started talking about what we would have to do to rescue her because she was out of money and it was getting cold. And uh, she ended up getting to Holland and then uh, moving, into, uh, moving to Spain to live with us for a while with uh, her boyfriend at the time, Sean. And uh, uh, so that was the time that, that we actually got to live together in Spain. Uh, and it was, it was just a wonderful experience. It was a time when my kids really got out and when they felt comfortable exploring the village, we were so isolated that even though they were very little at the time, this is 2015, nine years ago, and they're 13 and 15 now. So this is, they're very little and they would just go out and explore. They would go to the store on their own. They would go hang out with neighborhood kids. Neighborhood kids would come by and call for them and they would go out and play. And they did a lot of their early school there, a lot of learning to read and uh, learning basic science and starting math. My mom, my, my wife was there, their mom was their teacher during that time. And uh, it was just, it was, a, it was a really great time um, for us as a family. It was, it was so incredibly exciting um, just the starting to live abroad. And we knew while we were there that this was the beginning of a big adventure. We knew we were only staying for 90 days in Spain, but we thought we were coming back pretty quickly. We were, our, our, guess at the time was that we were probably going to get a, uh, a permanent home in Europe that was going to be 90 on 90 off because that's how the Schengen region works. And then that we would find another location where we would swap uh, outside of the Schengen and do similarly, whether it was another location in Europe or whether it was a location in Latin America. That was our original thought. We didn't have a strong plan, but that was kind of where we thought it might go. Or we would find a home in Europe, such as southern Spain, which if we were to move back would easily be where we would pick to be and do 90 on and then go travel for 90 days and then come back for 90 days and then travel for 90 days. So we really thought that that was potentially the beginning of a long-term plan once we really decided on a location. And of course, Kenyar being up a mountain in a really tiny village was a place that it turned out my wife could not handle because it was so far up the mountain and she gets uh, really severe car sickness. And so doing the 24 switchbacks up the mountain for me was exhausting every time you go went to or from the village and for her, it made her sick. And so going even just to the grocery store was too much of an deal for us. So that particular village did not work out for us in the way that we had hoped, but it was a beautiful experience. We really could not have done better on our first spot. Like we picked the right country, the right region, and just the most amazing house. And that house will always have really, really special memories for us. It was such an important time of, uh, I was working from home full time. That was the first that we had done that in, in many years. Uh, now I had been working uh, in, in an office in 2014, almost never from home, only a couple days during the year. But then at the end of the year, I got a non-work from home block of time where I got to be at home. So that was great. But then this was, we knew we were having an expansive time where I had a job and it was going to allow me to be at home and do, do work and be with the kids full time. And that was really important for us. It was a huge part of our life planning that I wanted to be home with my kids. That was a priority. Uh, and so this was the start of our travels, the start of our living outside of the United States, the start of our being home all the time as a family. It was just so many wonderful things and such an exciting time and such a perfect location for bringing that all together. Like it's, it's hard not 
to wax nostalgic thinking about what a great time in our lives that was. And being in that little village, um, sometimes I would go up and climb the mountain and and sometimes amazing storms would roll in and we would explore and we got to know a lot of people in the village. Uh, even though it was a short time there, it was it was amazing. And um, we there were these old waterways that have been man- maintained for like a thousand years from the time of the Moroccan occupation. And uh, a lot of the, the fields and, and a lot of parts of town were fed by these old waterways. And there was one of those spots we were walking one day with the kids and Liesl just decided it was the perfect spot. And we called it Liesl's sunset spot. And a couple of times we went back there and Luciana and Liesl would be so excited. We'd go for a walk to Liesl's sunset spot. We would sit there and watch the sun going down uh, over over the, the hills out to the west. And just with these gorgeous views of the Mediterranean to the south and the twinkling waves as they hit the beach far, far away. It was it was truly a magical experience, both being in that village and, and being in Spain in general and just the whole time of our lives. Um, and, and knowing that it was the start of a major adventure um, that, that we just didn't know where it was going to take us uh, was such a big deal. And while we were there, we thought that we were going to be leaving there and moving on to Argentina. Our plan at the time was that we were going to go immediately to a uh, cruise where we would spend, we thought we were going to spend um, 90 days to 180 days living in Argentina and then take a cruise around the Horn uh, to Chile and spend 90 days living in Chile. That was our plan for when we left Spain, but a bunch of stuff with my work ended up changing and we ended up going on from Spain to Panama. Uh, But uh, our time in Spain was absolutely magical and um, so many of my favorite memories of living in Europe are from that time in Spain. My favorite night walk, Seville, Sevilla and, and um, Cadiz, my favorite cities to walk late at night and just absorb the culture in the quiet still of the night after everyone has gone to bed. There's just so much to explore, driving across the most beautiful countryside. Most everything about Spain just came together as, as that perfect place for us in so many ways. It was very cost effective. The weather was nice. People were nice. Food was amazing. We learned that we absolutely fell in love with tapas culture and would eat tapas all the time. We, we really liked the food that we got there and the wine, of course, and having friends come and stay with us. It's really the only time that we've ever had friends. We've had uh, our friend Ryan has come a couple different places and visited us briefly, including he came and visited us in uh, Nicaragua a number of years ago, um, and a couple other places. Uh, he came to Italy, for example. But in general, um, it, it's we've had very few people, no matter where we've lived in the world, that came and visited us. And having Rachel come and stay with us in Spain was a really special experience as well that we, we just haven't had the opportunity to have again anywhere else. Now that they're a bit older, Spain is a very distant memory for my children, which is very sad for me because as a parent, that was one of the most iconic moments in our lives. I think for both my wife and I, it's hard to imagine anything holding such a dear spot in just the ecosystem of our family as those months in Spain because we had so much time together and we did so many family activities that were so exciting. We And we spent our weekends being tourists. I was in a position where my job uh, let me work during the week and then the weekends we really did have free, which is not something I've had a lot since then. As you guys know, I do YouTube all the time. My job does go seven days a week. I'm just very active with a bunch of things. And at the time, because of just where we were in our lives, we didn't do that. Um, I did in Spain, though, think about maybe starting a YouTube channel. That was the first that we, we kind of kicked that idea around around and I bought a GoPro 4 for that trip. And that was the very first that I had a GoPro, very first I tried to film anything. Um, and, and certainly I did not start making uh, <laughs> real uh, YouTube footage while we were there, but it was where the idea kind of occurred to us uh, and we started just kind of giving it a try. I also took a camera with me on the 2012 trip. It was a Nikon AW100, which only did 1080p. And we got a little bit of footage from that. It's been a long road for me to come from wanting to make some content to having any idea of what to do and how to do it. And then one could argue that I still don't know how to do it very well, but I do make a lot of it. I am dedicated to the process. Uh, and uh, so this was the first that we started looking at that in that perspective. And I started gathering some content uh, that to maybe use later, which of course it was all terrible and I wasn't prepared for what to do with it and didn't know how I would use it, but it was the very first. Uh, and then the next year I get the GoPro 5 because um, then the Karma Grip came out. A few things changed, but but Spain was the start of many things for us. It really was just a special time in our lives. And uh, 
it's it's hard not to recommend Spain to everyone who's who's looking at places you need to evaluate. For us, of course, the question is going to come up. So you really did love Spain. It's hard for any place to be so magical. What are the things that really caused us not to decide to make the effort to, to make the full move to Spain. And there's a, there's a number of things. One is we wanted to explore a lot of the world yet. It was the very first place we went, and so there was no way we were gonna settle anywhere. Even now, after 10 years of constantly living abroad and having done multiple grand tours and explored all kinds of regions of the world, for me, I'm very, like, I want a home base. I want a place that, that is our home here in Nicaragua and that I still wanna explore. My wife still has a bit of like, I just, I wanna explore all the time. It's hard to even think of having a home base after all this time. My kids, however, they really like having um, a home base and tra they love traveling, but they want they want to do a little bit less of the of the percentage of the time than we do. So we, we knew we were going to be moving on at the time. Um, the the time zone being so far from uh, our family in the United States, that was big, right? Always having to be, you know, five, six hours off in time zone, uh, any job I was doing, any work I was doing, any clients I was talking to, just anything was shifted so far that that was pretty dramatic. These days we could deal with that a lot better, but I also don't want to be tied in my, like, I want my evenings to be a lot more free than they were back then. And I know I work a lot now, but it would be far worse if we were in Europe. Uh, and being so far, it was so difficult to go see family. Many hours, quite expensive. Um, those things have gotten a little bit better now, but it's basically the same. Um, those are things that this part of Latin America has really solved for us. We're in the same time zone as back home, and it's very fast for us to travel back and forth. It's also a little bit more cost effective here. A big deal for Spain is that we kept looking at that 90-90 system where we'd you know, get a solid three months. But what would we do? Buy a house and only live there half time if we manage to always be there half time? Would we rent for three months and give it up and then move back in? That's very transitory and not really comfortable. We could probably buy a spot in Spain. That would be a reasonable way to go, but it's not ideal. So there's a lot of logistics there that made it difficult. If you want to get permanence in, in Spain where you're actually getting citizenship, which would be wonderful. You have to live there for 10 years. We're not citizens of a Latin American country. So we have this really long time frame that we would have to deal with uh, in order to get that assurance that that is our, our country. That's a lot of investment in a single place. And while we love Spain, and that would be a place that we'd be happy to be citizens, that's a huge amount of time to hope it works out and to have nothing go wrong and to not really be traveling other places. You have to be there roughly con continuously for 10 years. So that's really complicated. You can get residency. We can do things to make that happen. It was not out of the question, but it was a lot of commitment to Spain that we just weren't ready to make to any one place. Spain was a very big contender if a single spot was going to be treated that way. Spain just didn't seem like it worked that way for us and nowhere did. Um, Nicaragua gives us real ability to be based here and to travel and to go home and see family and do all those things easily and to to not have this complicated system. Of course, in the past, we could have, but we didn't. We had a very simple system in the past in here in Nicaragua. And now that we are full residents, we have a simple system as well. All things that if we were in Spain, we would still be dealing with one type of very complicated uh, residency system or another which would be fine, but it just wouldn't be ideal. Uh, Nicaragua just pulled forward in some of these ways, but our time in Spain was amazing. If I was going to live in Europe, if you told me I had to live in Europe right now, I just had to get on a plane, no other factors. Where would you want to go? Spain is my answer, I'm sure. Um, I think all four of us pretty much always agree that Spain is our favorite place in Europe, the best place that we were, the best experience that we had living somewhere, and from what we learned of the country around us, the place that most likely would offer us the lifestyle and long-term uh, life situation that we would be happiest with. So, uh, if we were if we were going to be returning and didn't have another factor, I don't think there's anywhere else we would need to investigate uh, to know where our first choice is. Where in Spain, that would be up in the air quite a bit more. But uh, Lanjarón definitely holds a very special place for me. I absolutely love that region just south of Granada, and the tapas culture there is fantastic. Of course, like anywhere, things have changed, and who knows if it's the same now as it was back then. But look up uh, Ken Yar and check out the area, and if anyone's interested, I can hook you up with the original house that we stayed in, I'm sure, uh, and you can go visit the region and and follow our in our footsteps of exploring Europe. Um, if we were to return to Europe now um, with, a, with a plan to stay, almost certainly it would be because of citizenship in Italy, and then we'd be looking at it for different reasons. Italy was fantastic as well, as we talked about in the episode the other day, but uh, Italy was not our first place that we moved, and so Spain will always have 
that romanticized place in my memory for sure. Um, and, uh, and certainly I miss it. And every place you live leaves you longing for the places you don't. And so that's just something to be aware of. You're always going to miss so many places. If you're a traveler and you've been places and you, and you love them, you can't be in all of them. You have to give up all the others for the one that you choose. And we don't regret that decision, but it doesn't mean we don't miss those places as well. I also miss Greece and Romania a lot. Those are, those are very dear places in my heart. And uh, there's, you know, so many places we'd like to be able to spend time. Life just doesn't give you enough minutes for all the things that you hope to be able to do. Uh, we're going to, in the second half, talk about uh, what needs to be done for people who are holding on to physical metals as part of their investment portfolio and how you're going to handle that. So uh, if you're going to stay for that, awesome. If not, take a moment to like and subscribe. Uh, we're going to throw the banner up here. You can buy me a coffee to help support the channel. Just buymeacoffee.com slash Scott L. Miller. That is like Patreon and, and you can just, you know, buy me a coffee or, or three. And it really makes a huge difference in us being able to afford all the things that we have to do here. We also have our membership program. There's a join button right down there. It's $5 a month. We have a secret little group where we can chat and, and have kind of a, a behind the scenes conversation as to what's going on here with all the other members and me. I try to prioritize communications there. It's the best way to be able to grab me quickly. Uh, and, um, Beyond that, uh, share with someone who might be interested in travel, relocation, Latin America, Europe, all those things, um, or just likes to hear someone ramble a lot. That's wonderful as well. And for those who are interested, stick around. Otherwise, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Okay, for our second portion, we're going to be talking about a question about how you deal with precious metals or really any kind of investment metals that you may have. And this could investment commodities that you have physically uh, when moving between countries. We'll talk a little bit about specifics, but mostly these are generalities. So if you're here for only for the travel discussion, you want to hear about Spain, you can uh, wrap it up now. I appreciate everyone uh, who joined us, but uh, these are two very different topics, but I wanted to cover these questions today. But I do appreciate everyone who's sticking around or who skipped ahead and is only at this portion. All right, let's get to it. So the question is, uh, if you're moving in this example from the U.S. to Nicaragua, but it could be mostly anywhere, how do you deal with investments that are physical metals? So um, so there's the ability to invest, and we'll just use gold as an example. This applies to a lot of things. You can invest in gold in a virtual way, where you're getting something like an ETF, where you have you have an ownership of gold, but you're not physically storing it yourself. And then, of course, you can actually buy gold, like you can go and carry it in your pocket, right, which is easier than it sounds. <laughs> if you've never invested in gold, you may be picturing bars and bars of gold bullion that you're moving around. And that's not realistic. Most people have a coin or two, maybe 10, right? Gold is worth a lot by weight. So even a fairly large investment probably won't take up a lot of physical space. So often you find it in the, in the form of coins or something of similar size, uh, gold bars, but they're very, very small, often encased in plastic to keep them safe. Anyway, so that's often how it is done. But if you had, a, you know, multiple tons of tin or something, it would be very large and bulky. So we have a couple different things uh, to consider when we're talking about physical gold stores, right? First of all, just in general, as someone who may invest in gold or other metals, you have to store it somewhere and you have to keep it safe. These things are prone to theft. So they have a certain danger that comes with them that it's very easy to accidentally leave them behind, have them destroyed in, say, a fire or a sinking of a ship, something like that. Those things are, they're not replaceable. If they go down with the ship, they're gone. You could insure it in theory. I don't know very many places they'll insure money, but you could give it a try, give Lloyd's a call, whatever. So you always have this problem that someone may break in and simply take it. And things like precious metals are effectively untraceable. They can always be melted down. They can be resmelted. They just disappear with very short amounts of time. It's not like currency, printed currency is going to have serial numbers on it that can in theory be traced. Uh, digital currency, you know, the Bitcoin type stuff, those things are very traceable if stolen. So it's, it's metals carry a lot of additional risks. And we warn people heavily against gold or, or metal investing in general. It's not really investing. It's a hedge, which is not exactly an investment. And the money to be made on anything like this is not through investments. It's through trading. You actually make your money on the trades, which if you're a full-time professional trader, that can make sense. And that's just another vehicle that you work with. But if you're a person, any normal person, anyone who has questions, anyone who isn't 
full time making seven figures or better, it should never cross your mind to invest in a metal in any form, but especially not in physical ones. Even ETFs and such carry huge risks because they are not designed to make money. They're designed to hedge against the global economy, right? They exist for when the whole world is falling apart. And I realize that the media is trying to sell you on that now, but that's just hype to sell you things. That's how they sell newspapers, right? Or you know what I mean, eyeballs on news cycles. The world economy is not burning down. That is not realistic. And if it did to the level that people are claiming is going to happen, it's going to take those ETFs with it, right? It's going to take all those metals with it ex expectedly, right? And people will give you examples that have nothing to do and say like, oh, it didn't happen in the past when this happened, but this, the thing that people are claiming has never happened in the past, right? So avoid metal investing. I cannot stress this enough, but if you do do metal investing, ETFs have someone else protecting your metals, someone else ensuring that the whole thing happens at scale. If you have physical metals, the amount of risk that you carry cannot be overstated. And this is exactly a perfect example. Yes, if the world economy burns down, those metals are going to turn to zero value. But even if it doesn't, if you have functional economies, now of course you can sell your physical metals, but if you need to do so, you're going to do so uh, at potentially a time where they're not at their peak. Gold has not been at its peak since 1978. So if you may be looking at holding out another 50 to 100 years to sell gold at a profit in some cases. So if you wanted to sell now to be able to move fluidly, that's difficult. So the problem with physical metals is that one, they are very difficult to move around in any scale. Two, Anytime you're moving physical metals, um, if you're moving between countries, uh, to move those means you have to cross a border with them. That means you have to declare them. So in some cases, you have to pay taxes on them. In some cases, they're not going to be allowed to be transferred. It's not like currency where you're allowed to take basically as much as you want. You just have to declare it. Metals are often not allowed to be moved because it's an importation. It's not exactly money. Uh, and very importantly, some metals, such as gold specifically, carry additional risks, often countries have a tax for taking them out of the country, and many countries have a tax for bringing them into the country. And sometimes that tax can be very hefty. So you may be looking at a intense loss of value simply by shifting it between countries. Metals specifically are not a protection against disaster. Everyone wants to sell you on this, right? This is the scam. Every con artist who's trying to make money on metals will tell you things like it's what you use in case of an emergency but metals do not easily cross borders. It sounds like they would. It sounds like this is a thing that, you know, it's just, it's just a metal. How can it have a problem crossing borders? It is specifically a thing that has problems crossing borders. And when it's a metal with value, gold, platinum, silver, those things have much higher problems crossing borders. Often there's a way to do it, but there's often a cost and a risk. You have to declare it. And if you don't declare and you say, well, I don't know what its value is, they get to determine what its value is. If you have U.S. currency, you get to just move across borders. You have $9,999. They can't say a thing to you because you're under $10,000. But if you have gold, they go, ah, I think at the moment you were crossing, the amount of gold you had was worth more than $10,000. You didn't declare it. It's all ours now. So it's everything else you own. Right? So be careful when you're crossing with metals. If you don't declare all the value that you're bringing across the border, they get to take it. I don't know any border that doesn't require you to declare above $10,000 U.S. value. And I don't know any border that doesn't have a and we get to just keep it if you don't do that. And then most borders will have a tax if you're moving something like gold, but not everyone. Also worth noting, if you're an American and you're coming to Nicaragua, you have sanctions against you by the U.S. government. It has nothing to do with Nicaragua. It has to do with the American government and the American people. There is a sanction against Americans. And technically, it only involves you cannot in any way be associated with the mining industry for gold in Nicaragua. However, if you move gold specifically into Nicaragua, you have no means of showing provenance after it's moved that that gold did not originate in Nicaragua and that it didn't come from the mining industry. So you have a risk of total property seizure by the U.S. I don't know what they do to people who break sanctions. I don't know what they do to people who claim that they claim break sanctions. I'm not saying you would break sanctions. I'm saying that you would be in a position potentially where you'd be holding something that you could not show didn't come from sanctions breaking. And the penalties for that can be extreme. There's no case, none where you would want to be holding gold and have been in Nicaragua. Now, if you're in Nicaragua, right, and, and no one knows you have gold and you buy it and sell it here, well, 
probably it's untraceable. But if you want to take that gold out of Nicaragua, you're going to risk being caught in a theory of having done sanctions breaking. Doesn't mean you did. It just means you'll have no way to, it's just metal. So metal carries in this case, a risk of such magnitude. It's, it's impossible for people to understand how much risk there is, because if you understood the risks of having metals as a investment vehicle, you would never consider having them, right? This, anyone who has metal isn't considering the risk because you don't like, and people say, well, big banks do it. Well, countries do it. Yes. Those things do not cross borders. They are not people. They have different risk profiles and they're doing it for different reasons. One, none of those things, no business that's buying gold, no country that's buying gold has less than a million dollars, typically less than a billion dollars, right? You may be talking about countries with trillions of dollars and they have very complex hedging strategies. They have manufacturing strategies. They have all kinds of things that they have to do, things that do not apply to you. Even if you had a hundred million dollars, it may not apply to you. It is really important that we not look at entities that are wholly different than us with completely different needs as things that we should do to copy. That doesn't mean we should rule them out in all cases simply because they're different than us. They may know things that we don't know, but countries hold currency, for example, because they have to have it for day-to-day -day trading, for paying national salaries, for paying military, for, for investments in, in infrastructure. They have to have liquidity at a government level for all kinds of reasons that do not in any way apply to you. You do not have to, as an individual person, maintain a certain amount of banking liquidity to be able to handle international export and import imbalances. That's not a thing that you have to do as a person, but countries do normally. And so things like gold and, and foreign currencies are held to enable international transfers under certain circumstances. And governments, when they're transferring in those currencies or in gold, don't have to worry about the taxes that you may have to worry about. And they can simply use them as a, uh, as a hedge and all kinds of things. There's lots of reasons why governments use those things and you do not. Also, many governments hold things like gold and many other resources as partial uh, backing for their currency systems. That is, again, that's not a thing that you're doing. You're not issuing your own currency. So backing your own non-existing currency is not a reason to have those things. So all the logic that goes into the entities that do sensibly potentially hold those things do not apply to you. In fact, the things that make them sensible for like the U.S. government to have some gold, if you understood why the U.S. does that, it would tell you why it doesn't make sense for you to do that, right? The reasons they do it are the antithesis of why you would have gold. So if you have these things, one, do not try to cross a national border with them. This is just incredibly foolish. It's expensive to move them if there's any amount. Now, if we're talking about like I've got $300 worth of gold, it's one coin, I can slip it in my pocket. Look, you're probably fine. Probably nobody cares that you have one gold coin minted, probably somewhere obvious, and you're not going to do anything but hold on to it. Like, okay. But why? Because you're not going to be able to use it in Nicaragua. You're not going to be able to trade it. It's not going to be a safe uh, uh, financial hedge in any way. You will probably get far less value out of it. Sell it while you can. Move money in a sensible way. Uh, if you if you have a lot, if you have more than ten thousand dollars, there is no reasonable way that you're going to be able to bring that into Nicaragua. Could you figure it out? A way to do it? Yes. Could you get permission to do it? Yes. As long as it's not gold and you are just really passionate about having a metal collection, okay. But if it's any kind of investment, unload it and work with normal investments. If you want to be invested, invest so you make money. Remember, metals don't make you money. They're, they're basically like a currency. They're a commodity, but they're basically like a currency in that they don't fluctuate very much. Uh, there's a little bit of speculation in some areas, but very little of it is very good. And whatever you're doing with metals, you can do some other way. So take this opportunity to unload those metals and free yourself. Those things are a millstone around your neck. They keep you from being able to move at a moment's notice. They keep you from being able to be tax-free. There's a lot of risk, right? If you suddenly had an emergency, you're in Nicaragua, you suddenly had to move for some reason, right? Oh, you didn't get the residency you were hoping for. Oh, you changed your mind about where you want to live. Suddenly there's a better deal somewhere you want to go to. And you're going to have to say, but we have this, all of our money is tied up in a giant block of lead that's going to take 12 trucks to move. I realize that's a ridiculously extreme example. But no matter what, it's going to make you and your freedom to move between borders really, really hard. And it forces you 
to violate the basic rules of banking when moving to another country, which is you don't shift your wealth into your new country under normal circumstances. There must be exceptions, but I know of none where you would shift your wealth into the future country, except in extreme cases where you are completely giving up your old uh, citizenship and you have zero ties and no way to use the place that you're coming from. Now, some people have intermediary countries. I realize sometimes it gets a little bit complex, but it is extremely rare. Even if you just have a U.S. bank account, Canadian bank account, British bank account, Spanish bank account, you name it, and you're moving into Nicaragua, Honduras, Argentina, it doesn't matter. You do not just take your wealth and move it into the new country. You move into the new country. Your wealth stays where it is. When you need to use it in the new country, you pull it in as needed, right? That could be through an ATM. It could be through a wire transfer. It could be through something similar. It could be a shipping container full of your gold bullion. Mostly kidding. Uh, but you move it in as you need it. You do not just shift it because you're shifting. So if we were to keep this, if you were truly passionate about keeping a collection of metals, which I cannot warn enough against, but if that's something that you are just going to do, no matter what I say, then the thing you would do is not bring it with you. It needs to be kept in a secure facility somewhere in your home country where it is now. Presumably the United States, you would want to store it in the United States because it's you don't voluntarily move wealth between countries. That is how you run into problems. That's where you get costs and taxes and risk and that overhead that you don't need. Move it as needed, not proactively. And that's, I know when people are moving countries, there is this unbelievable temptation to just shift money and be like, well, I'm moving to this new country. All of my money should come with me. That is not at all how it works. That is just a horrible idea. And that's even if you can. Right now, in most cases, we're talking about banks. Now we're talking about physical uh, gold or, or physical metals. I'm sorry. I jump to gold quite often. I mean metals when I'm saying it. Um, with the exception of gold, does have that one additional tax risk that is extreme that people often don't uh, don't think about. When you're told about gold and you said, oh, you look at the numbers and you look at how it holds its value over time and all these things, it starts to sound good. But m most people have a couple mistakes that they, they make. One is they don't look at the historic value of gold during the time period that is relevant, meaning since it's been on the market. They look at numbers from before it was on the market and pretend it's gone way up in value instead of looking at its initial values in 1978 and seeing that it's lost value over time. Most people uh, look at its its hard value and not its uh, inflation value. They don't adjust for inflation over time, so they don't realize how much value it's lost since 1978, which is not a ton, but it has lost value. Every day that you, it, now, if there's individual moments. If you bought on days when it was low, sold when it was high, you can make money on the trading of gold, but you can't make money on the gold. But if you bought in 1978 and held for 40 years, more or less, you would have lost money, lost money, right? We're pushing 50 years of gold never hitting its initial sales value when it, when it adjusted up in 1978 to 1980. We still haven't returned to those values once you adjust for inflation. And even adjusting for inflation, we're not looking at market baseline, which is what the S&P 500 would have gained during that time in, in shared revenue and in market cap. You have to look at both. You can't just look at one. And so the amount, when you look at inflation, gold is insane. And no one who has looked at the numbers would keep gold. It is bonkers crazy to be holding gold. It is not protecting you. It does any, it just, just exposes you. But then if you adjust it for the S&P 500 baseline, the amount of money that gold would lose you holding it for 50 years is just insane. Like, like I, it's, I don't know, a thousand percent loss. It's an insane number. And then when you look at the risks that gold carries, that at any point it could have been stolen, you have to hold it for 50 years and never have any of it be stolen. You have to protect it and you can never cross a border without uh, being hit by taxes or at least having extreme risk. Those things make metals so dangerous so dangerous to hold on to. That is why people have moved away from it. That is why they are not considered normal things. That's why they're sold in conspiracy theory markets, right? It's the same places that are telling you Bitcoin's going to be the future, places that are telling you the world economy is collapsing. It's people who depend on panic and emotional responses to push these things because they actually carry so much danger that people have just moved away from it over time. There's a reason why when I was a kid, people were still thinking about carrying gold coins and now they would never 
think about doing that, even though the coins are worth less than they were back then. It's easier to use it as a currency now, but we've learned there's so much risk in that, that carrying precious metals on your person or in any physical way is not good. They need to be kept in secure facilities where they're really protected and, and then they can't cross borders. And you always have the risk of planes going down, boats sinking, things like that, like we said. So in a practical sense, the real thing you should do if you have physical metals is sell them, move to a liquid currency, keep that liquid currency in the place it came from. Don't move that either, but get rid of the metals, move to something that will actually make you money over time. Let your money work for you. Don't work for, you're literally working to pay to keep the metals, right? You have to pay to protect them. So they actually lose money on that over time as well. That's not calculated in to the trading value. All that safety, any safe you have to put them in, any safety deposit box you're going to keep them in, any warehouse you're keeping them in, all those things cost you money and you're just bleeding to hold on to metals that over time generally lose money. There's just so much risk to this. So the, the best thing is liquidate the metals, take whatever currency there is, keep it in the US, Canada, wherever it's coming from, invest it in something that'll actually make money, like an index fund, just let it make you money instead of losing you money. And then when you need that money in Nicaragua or wherever you're moving to, simply use an ATM or a wire transfer or whatever and bring just the amount you need for maybe the next month, six months, something practical. If you know you're gonna be buying a car, bring enough for the car, you know, even if it's three months away. I'm not saying never move a penny without needing to, but, but practical, money you actually know you're gonna spend or suspect you're gonna spend in the near future not not just moving wealth that's being stored. Stored wealth should always be in investments. That means things that pay dividends, never things that just sit, right? Never Bitcoin, never never metals, investments, um, and uh, things, that, things that grow. If those are things you're not going to do, if you just feel the need to hold on to metals, then you need to leave them in the place where they are and find a way to store them safely in the place that they already are. I know that's a lot. And I know it's not what people want to hear. People love the idea of metals. People are passionate and emotional about metals. But when it comes to investing, no honest person is going to tell you that it is safe or wise to hold on to metals. If you're an active trader and you're, and you're working on arbitrage and you're using metals as part of the arbitrage portfolio, that's fine. But that is not you. That is nobody. Nobody holding on to metals is doing that. Knowing doing it physically is doing that. This is a different thing, right? And, when, and you hear these stories of, but I made money on gold. You know, they made money on gold arbitrage and they did it as an active trader. They did not do it by holding on to things. No one is making money by holding on to metals. Literally no one. So, Step back, nothing that you think of as an investment should ever have an emotional component, ever. That is absolutely how you lose money. Avoid any emotional response. If you feel, but I feel, it makes me feel safe. Get away from it. Money should not make you feel safe like that. You should, oh, the only thing that, about money that should make you feel safe is having more of it. Throwing away, your only safety comes from total economic power, right? Near shore living, Ron has some great points. People who are safe are the rich. People who are in danger are the poor. Holding on to metals voluntarily moves you from a certain level of rich to less rich, closer to poor. Right? So don't voluntarily be more poor as an emotional response. If you want to protect yourself, protect your family, protect your future, just have more wealth, not less. And, and never let emotions drive what you think wealth is. Right? The rich do not let that's why they have advisors, right? Advisors who it's not their money because they can step back and say, nope, we're just going to make money. I don't care what feels good. We're going to do what mathematically makes sense, right? And they know how to run those analysis. So watch out for people who are selling you smoke and mirrors, who are giving you panic, people who are telling you that the economies are collapsing around the world. They're, they're not looking out for you, right? That, they're not real financial advisors. They're con artists. So I know it's not what people want to hear. It is not, the, but the message is simple. Good, solid, standard investment practices that have been true for hundreds of years remain true. The world has not fundamentally changed. We want to believe it has because it just adds to the emotional drama of everything, but it hasn't. Okay. Like, and subscribe. Thanks for joining me. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Coffee is the true currency of the future. And as always, I will see all of you tomorrow.